Dear friends in Christ, may the hope and joy of Christ our Savior be with you now and always. Amen. On HGTV or Home and Garden Television, there's a show that maybe some of you are familiar with that airs on Thursday nights called Divine Design. Now, personally, I'll be honest with you, I don't really watch it, uh, but I am at least aware of it. There's a host by the name of Candace Olson who comes into a homeowner's home house and she walks into one particular room and she fixes it. She takes this homeowner's room that was in shambles and makes it shiny. She takes it from a dump to a design. She really has an eye, and she picks a pillow or a couch or whatever it might be, and she takes that and with a splash of color and a hand, at least according to her, makes it beautiful. Sometimes, as far as I know, the homeowners don't always feel the same, but at least there's a design to the room. Now, how nice would that be if you could do that with your life? A divine design for your life, a, an idea where you could just fix your life, where you could invite someone in and they would just be able to turn it around. Take those dreary drapes of disappointment, tear them off the wall. Shove that sofa of sadness out the window, re re remove that rug of rejection, and come back to sparkling clean with a design. Then, if we could do that, we'd be better Christians, right? We'd be better Christians who are ready to go out in the world, ready to conquer the world, ready to share our faith and share God's love with people. If only it were that easy. There are people who say that it's that easy. They come into your life and they, they call themselves life coaches. Maybe you've heard of these people before. They come into your life and they tell you what's wrong with it, how you can fix it. If you do this, that, and the other thing, you'll be great and you'll be glad and ready to go. Perhaps you've heard of these people. As far as I know, they're not very successful but that's not how they market themselves. That being, said, that being said, though, as all of us really know, life is not that easy. That divine design for life doesn't come from a book or from a, t a television show. It doesn't come from a life guide. It doesn't come easily. In fact, as we look at our lives, sometimes it seems like we know the nitty-gritty side of things. We know that there's darkness and there's sadness in our lives. We know that there's dirt and there's grime. We know that life is not perfect in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, we oftentimes focus on that imperfection, don't we? We struggle with it because we see it on a daily basis. We wrestle with it on a regular basis. It's hard for us to get rid of those disappointments, sadness, depression, rejection, fears, pride, and a slew of other things. It's hard for us to push those out of our lives and to focus on God, our Savior. And sometimes it gets so hard that we are just ready to give up, aren't we? Maybe it's not one thing, but it's several things coming together. Maybe it is that one thing that breaks the camel's back, the straw that breaks the camel's back. But we know what Elijah was feeling when he said those words, I give up. I've had enough. We can't take it anymore. When we look at Elijah, just look at his path. Look at the way he went. Things weren't easy for Elijah in any way, shape, or form, were they? Here we have at, the, at, at our reading today what seems like he's coming off a of victory. But that was after three years of defeat. He had gone through three years running from the evil king Ahab, the evil queen Jezebel. He had run from them because God had brought a drought on the land. And he was afraid for his life. Finally, God called him back into Jerusalem. He said, go to Ahab. Remember, God called him to Ahab. Tell him the drought's going to end. But first, we have to have a little showdown. And this is where I encourage you to turn to 1 Kings 18, because this is where the showdown takes place. God lines up himself against the false god Baal who is not a real God. Here Elijah is the spokesman for God, the one who feels alone, lined up against 450 priests and prophets from Baal. And the, ba and the prophets to Baal, they spend all day crying out to Baal, who is only a fig uh, part of their imagination, a figment of their imagination. They cry out, they cut themselves, they throw themselves on the ground. They do whatever they can to try and get their God's attention and nothing. Elijah's doing pretty good. He even goes so far as to mock them a little bit. He's feeling pretty well about things. He calls on the name of the Lord. But first, wait, let me back up the story a little. While they were doing this, calling, on, calling for the fire, Elijah had his altar drenched with water. He had it drenched so much so that there was a pool surrounding it. And then he called on the name of the Lord. And the Lord, with fire from heaven, licked up all Yahweh, the true God, destroyed everything, showing his almighty power. You would think Elijah would be doing well. He had just come off a great victory. 
How do we feel when we've come off a great victory? Maybe it's not always a victory in, in terms of a sports victory, but how, how often do we feel when we've come off a good victory? A great week with our spouse. We, we didn't fight once. A great week with our kids. We seem to get along pretty well. A great week in the office. We nailed that pre- presentation. A great week with the doctor. Nothing new is going on in our lives. And we feel great. And then there's always something that comes, isn't there? Elijah, as soon as that happened, Jezebel said, I swear my life, I'm going to get you. By the way, she was unsuccessful, just so you know. But, but Elijah didn't know that at the time. And he was pretty downright scared. He was pretty downright upset. And he was pretty downright sick and tired of being running for his life. And so he had gone out into the desert to die. That was his goal. That's why he didn't bring bread. That's why he didn't bring water. He went out in the desert because he'd rather be with his ancestors. Just hear his words again. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. I'd rather lay in the tomb next to them. Wow. Wow, strong words, aren't they? Have you felt that way before? Sadly, I think there's very few of us who haven't at some time in our life experienced that time in our life where we are just down and out, where we have walked the way of God. Notice Elijah had walked the way of God. He had gone the direction God had told him to go. And sometimes we do that too. We walk those way, that way with God. We attend church. We give faithfully. We, we pray faithfully. We read our scriptures regularly. We talk to God. We spend our lives with God. We even help out people in need. We try to live our lives according to His law. And yet things still continue to happen. Things continue to build up against us. It seems like no matter how faithful we are, there's still so many things that uh, accumulate. Instead of that good health that we were hoping to hear about, we hear about another need that we have for a surgery, an MRI, or a CT scan. Instead of being able to pay more bills, being able to catch up with our finances, we find ourselves struggling to figure out what we can cut out so that we can stay afloat. Instead of our families growing closer together, our conversations growing longer and more rich, we find them shorter or non-existent. And you can insert your own too, because you know that in your own lives, there are things that even though you have walked faithfully with God, there are things in your own lives that you feel like are slipping away. Things that even though you were hoping for a victory are becoming these defeats. We struggle because we know those words of Paul. We hear those wonderful words that Paul says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. Philippians 4.13. Paul said those words from prison. But we struggle to repeat those words. We struggle because we want God to meet us on our terms. We want God's divine design for our lives to be just what we have designed it to be. We want God to fix things on our terms. But that's not how, the, how God works, is it? God doesn't fix things on our terms. He doesn't come to us on our terms or fix our lives in the way that we expect Him to. And thankfully, He doesn't. Because think about it. Think, ab- think about what it means for us to say, let my will instead of thy will be done. Come to me on my terms. What does that look like in your life? A lot of times, my terms, my will, it sounds a lot like selfishness. It sounds like a lot like self-indulgence. Instead of putting God first, it's putting me first. Instead of putting others first, it's putting my comforts and my desires first. Instead of worshiping one true God, I worship whatever is convenient at that time. See, my will is not that great. Our wills are tainted by sin. Our wills are destroyed by death. And ultimately, they lead to death. Ultimately, our wills, when we call God to us on our terms, when we want Him to do things our way, it leads to death. It leads to death and sin. And we know this, too. We know this because we confess it. We confess that I am by nature sinful and unclean. I am dead in my trespasses. But it is only from that view of death that we can see, that we can see what it means for God to come to us on His terms. It's only from that view of death that we can see what it means for God to meet us where we are as dead people, dead in our sins and trespasses. It is only at that point that we can understand truly what it means for God to change our lives from death to life. For you see, God's terms are not our terms. His ways are not our ways. His plans are not our plans. And His designs are not our designs. And thankfully they're not because His plans are greater. His designs are better. 
His designs are those that can resurrect a dead person to life. His designs are those that can take a, take a, peop- a people full of sin and death. And instead of seeing them as the wicked people they are, can see them as sons and daughters, not for our will, but for what Christ has done for us, for his sacrifice on the cross for us, that Jesus said, thy will be done, Father. Let your will be done. He prayed, may this cup pass from me, but your will be done. He prayed that the Lord would take it from him, but he still went to the cross. The Father, When the Father called him to the cross, he went for us. He chose what he knew what was to come. He knew that he would be forsaken by the Father so that we would be accepted. See, on our terms, we would look to do it ourselves, but on his terms, he did it all for us. On his terms, God came to us in the midst of our sin and death and at just the right time rescued us. That is the beauty of what it means to be a Christian person. That is the beauty of what it means to know God as our Savior. That it means that God comes to us that he meets us on his terms, on in his ways, and his terms, his ways, they are those that are motivated from his love for us. His terms and his ways are motivated from his grace, his mercy in our lives. His terms and his ways reveal to us that his design, his divine design, is greater than we could ever imagine. See, the divine design that God has for our lives it doesn't just it isn't just about our salvation. Oh, believe me. That is the key point. That is the most perfect part. The divine design that God has for each of us to be with him forever in heaven. That is the, the cornerstone of our faith and the cornerstone of our lives. But the divine design that God has for our lives, it stretches beyond that. Because he looks into each of our lives and he has created each of us uniquely. He has knit us together in the womb wonderfully. And he has made us to be his children to share his love with others, to share his gospel message. He has placed you in a specific place in your life that you can share his word. He has chosen you by his divine design to in the place where you are to proclaim the good news that our God saves, that our God has defeated death, and that our God has rescued each one of us. That is the divine design that he has for each Christian's life, for each person's life. He has not abandoned this world, this world that has abandoned him. We look around and so often we feel like Elijah. We feel like there's no hope, that all is gone and all is lost. But our God has a plan and he has a design. He has a divine design that is greater than any political maneuverings or any political designs. He has a divine design that overcomes hate and overcomes the wickedness. He has a divine design and that is to use his people, to use his people to share the gospel message to change the hearts of this broken world, to change their lives so that they may know him, to know his promises. And he doesn't always do it the way we expect or the way that we plan for him to do it. He doesn't always do it in the way that we think that he should do it. Elijah, shortly after Jesus, after the, the father feeds him in the desert, shortly after that, God calls him to Mount Horeb, as you saw there. And God says, I'm going to come to you, Elijah. And Elijah, he He camps out in a cave. And first, a great wind goes by. God is not in that great wind. Then an earthquake shakes the whole mountain. God's not in that earthquake. Then a fire, a roaring fire sweeps up the mountain. And God is not in that fire either. Then a gentle whisper. A gentle whisper. A gentle whisper. And that is God. Sometimes we want God to do great and mighty things, amazing things that rock our world and and ignite our world. But that's not always how he works. Sometimes he works in a gentle whisper. Sometimes he speaks to us in those gentle whispers. Sometimes he changes lives with those gentle whispers. And when when, when our ears are open, when our hearts are open, we will hear those gentle whispers, no matter how quiet they are. We'll hear those gentle whispers in our lives that God is speaking to us, that God is using us, that God has chosen us. We'll hear those gentle whispers, and we'll see that indeed he has a divine design, and that design is good. Amen. Please pray with me. Gracious God, in the midst of this world that we live in, we give thanks to you that you are present. We give thanks to you that you walk with us each day, that you talk with us, that you lead us, and we pray that we would never turn from you. So often it is easier to call you to our terms. But Lord, those terms are empty and insignificant. Help us to look to your terms. 
Help us to see in your holy word, your guidance for our lives. Help us to see, Lord, that you have a design and a, and a plan for each of our lives. Lord, there is no such thing as fate or destiny, for everything is according to your will and your plan. Help us each day to see that and know that. Help us each day to have confidence that, uh, this, that the, your divine design is not only about this world, but that it is the world to come, that you have a plan that one day we may be with you forever. May this be the hope and comfort. May this be the consol- consolation and the peace that, we dwell, that dwell with us now and always. Through your name we pray, O Christ. Amen.